This presentation is part of the TI in Focus AP Calculus video series. In this video, I'll discuss the solutions, relevant concepts, and scoring guidelines associated with some of the parts of our 2020 mock AP Calculus exam, Form BC Question 1. My name is Steve Kokoska. I'm a professor at Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania, and I'm a former AP Calculus chief reader. Form BC question 1 involves the graph of g prime, the derivative of a twice differentiable function g. The graph of g prime has exactly one horizontal tangent line in the interval minus 1 to 10 at x equal 4.2. The plane region R is in the first quadrant, and it's bounded above by the graph of y equal g prime of x, below by the x-axis, and on the left by the y-axis. And we also know that g of 0 is equal to minus 7, g of 9 is equal to 12, and that the definite integral of g of x from 0 to 9 is 27.6. In part a, the student needs to find all the values of x in the interval minus 1 to 10, at which g has a critical point. And then they need to classify each critical point as the location on the graph of g of a relative minimum, relative maximum, or neither. And of course, they need to justify their answers. Here are some key concepts that we'll need in order to answer this question. First, we certainly need to know the definition of a critical point in order to solve this problem. And a critical number or critical point of a function f is a number c in the domain of f such that f prime of c is equal to 0 or f prime of c does not exist. Now, just a word about terminology here. The phrase critical number makes it clear, and it might be more appropriate to use, that these values are x values. They're not really points in the plane. However, the term critical point is consistent with AP calculus and calculus lingo in general in questions and solutions. Here's a little more background necessary to answer this question. Recall that Fermat's theorem says that if a function f has a local maximum or minimum at c, then c must be a critical number of f. But the converse of this theorem is not true. And that is, not every critical number is the location of a local maximum or local minimum. So, we need a method to determine whether f has a local maximum or minimum, or neither, at these candidates c. To make this determination, we can use the first derivative test. It says, suppose c is a critical number of a continuous function f. If f prime changes from positive to negative at c, well, then f has a local maximum at c. If f prime changes from negative to positive at c, then f has a local minimum at c. And if f prime has the same sign to the left and right of c, then f has neither a local max nor a local min at c. So this tells us that we can use the graph of f prime to identify critical points, but also to determine whether the graph of f has a local maximum, local minimum, or neither at each critical point. OK, let's use these concepts to solve this problem. First, let's identify the critical points on the graph of g. And to do this, we simply look at the graph of g prime. On the interval minus 1 to 10, there is only one place where the derivative is 0, and that's at x equal 9. And there are no places where the derivative does not exist. Now that sounds kind of funny, but there are no open circles or gaps in the graph of g prime. So the function g prime is defined on the interval minus 1 to 10. And even though we know there is a horizontal tangent line to the graph of g prime at x equal 4.2, that has no impact in this problem. Therefore, g has one critical point in the interval minus 1 to 10. 
and using the graph of g prime at x equal 9, g has a relative maximum because g prime changes from positive to negative there. You know, perhaps it's a good idea to pause here for a second and mention sign charts. Although not necessary here, a student could certainly construct a sign chart to help with the classification and justification associated with a critical point. But remember, sign charts alone are not sufficient justification. The student must present a sentence interpreting the sign chart. They must correctly communicate their conclusions from their chart. Here are some typical scoring guidelines for this type of a problem. This problem is worth two points. One point for identifying the only critical point, x equal 9, and one point for correctly classifying the critical point as a relative maximum and for providing appropriate justification. Here are some interpretations of these guidelines to help award points. First, the response must identify x equal 9 and no other x values. So, if the student presents two or three or five critical points, then they do not earn the first point. If an ordered pair is presented as the critical point, then the y-coordinate must be correct. So, the y-coordinate must be g of 9, which is equal to 12, as given in the statement of the problem. A common error here is to report the y-coordinate as 0. This is the y-coordinate that corresponds to g prime of 9. So, the following responses earn the first point. x equal 9, of course, and the ordered pair 9, 12. The following responses do not earn the first point. The ordered pair 9, 0, because again, g prime of 9 is equal to 0. And, for example, x equals 0, 4.2, and 9, because there are extra incorrect values presented as critical points. To earn the second point, the student must correctly classify the critical point, and the justification must discuss g prime changing from positive to negative at x equal 9. The justification is not earned for simply stating that g prime changes sign, or merely changes, at x equal 9. The student must be more specific. And finally, references to the slope or the derivative are just too ambiguous and do not earn the point. For example, a response like the slope changes from positive to negative at x equal 9 is just not sufficient justification. In Part B, the student needs to determine how many inflection points there are on the graph of g in the interval minus 1 to 10. And they need to provide a reason for their answer. Here are some important concepts needed to answer this question. First, we know that inflection points are associated with a change in concavity. So let's consider the concavity test. If f double prime of x is greater than 0 for all x in an interval i, then the graph of f is concave up on i. And if f double prime of x is less than 0 for all x in an interval i, then the graph of f is concave down on i. The concavity test allows us to draw conclusions about the behavior of the graph of f if f double prime of x is greater than 0 or f double prime of x is less than 0. Note that this doesn't say anything about the behavior of the graph of f where f double prime of x is equal to 0 or f double prime of x does not exist. Here's the formal definition for an inflection point. A point P on the graph of f is an inflection point if f is continuous there and the graph changes from concave up to concave down or concave down to concave up. Let's take a closer look at this definition and put everything together so that we can solve this problem. First, 
f double prime of x can change sign only when f double prime of x is equal to zero or when f double prime of x does not exist. So values of x for which this occurs lead to candidates for inflection points. Now a traditional straightforward way to determine if a candidate really is the x-coordinate of an inflection point is to use a sign chart. But remember, sign charts are not sufficient justification. Often on the AP Calculus exam, the student needs to use the first derivative to justify an inflection point. So combining the concavity test with the definition of an inflection point. The derivative of f prime, or f double prime of x, changes sign where f prime changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Therefore, we can use the graph of f prime to locate points of inflection on the graph of f. Using these concepts, or really understanding these concepts, we can easily solve this problem. For x between minus 1 and 10, there's only one place where the graph of g prime changes from increasing to decreasing, or vice versa, and that's at x equal 4.2. We know there is a horizontal tangent there, so the slope of g prime is 0, or equivalently, g double prime of 4.2 is equal to 0. And we can see that g prime is increasing to the left of x equal 4.2, or equivalently, g double prime of x is greater than 0, and decreasing to the right of x equal 4.2, or equivalently, g double prime of x is less than 0. So there's only one point of inflection on the graph of g, and it occurs at the point where x is equal to 4.2. And this is a point of inflection because the graph of g prime changes from increasing to decreasing there. Here are the scoring guidelines for part b, worth two points. One point for the answer, which is simply one, or one point of inflection, and one point for the reason. Here are some interpretations of these guidelines to help award points. We really want the student to convey an understanding of the relationship between the increasing and decreasing behavior of the first derivative, g prime, and the inflection points on the graph of g. With that overriding scoring policy in mind, the first point is earned simply for the answer 1 or one point of inflection. Well, with some relevant mathematical discussion. In other words, a bald one would not earn the first point. The reason point is earned for correctly appealing to the increasing and then decreasing behavior of g prime. And in this problem, if the student's reason is that g double prime changes sign there at x equal 4.2, that's sufficient for the reason point. I hope this video gives you a good idea of how to solve these problems using the necessary AP calculus concepts and a reasonable expectation of how they would be scored. We'll look at more parts of this free response question in the next video.